Hey everybody, this is Russ from Metro Game Court. Today we're going to take a look at this mini PC here. It is called the Minis Forum UM560. Now I've reviewed a lot of mini PCs over the past year on this channel, and I've always found that there seems to be a lot of bad that comes with the good with these. Typically it'll be something that's been overlooked by the manufacturer, or maybe it'll have a performance issue. Now I've had this one for a couple weeks now, and amazingly I didn't find anything wrong with it. This is kind of a rarity in the mini PC space. And there's one feature on this that really kind of took the cake, and that actually happens to be the power delivery options. This thing comes with a 65 watt GAN charger, the same kind of one you would find on a MacBook or a tablet. And so you could use that charger or a different 65 watt charger to connect directly to the mini PC. But here's where it gets interesting. It actually supports alt mode. And so if you have one of those fancy monitors that provide downstream connection, you could use a single USB cable to connect both the image as well as the power. And that's gonna result in a super clean look. Now the UM560 starts at $360 for the bare bones version. That means you'd have to include your own RAM and hard drive. The one I'm reviewing has 16 gigs of RAM and 512 gigs of storage. And so with it spec'd out, it's about $500. Now one thing to note here is they've actually added a second model that's going to start delivering next month. And this one will actually run the Ryzen 7 5800H. That's going to give it a pretty hefty spec bump for only a $50 difference. And I've already talked to Mini's forum, they're going to send out that 5800H model as well, but today we're going to take a look at this one here. This is the 5625U model. And I think you'll be surprised with the performance we'll get in today's computer. At $500, this easily outperforms others in that same price point. And so, without any further delay, let's dive into the review. Okay, to start, let's take a look at the specs. Now, like I mentioned, there are two different CPU models that are going to be available. We're going to focus on the 5625U. This one has 6 cores and 12 threads with a base clock of 3.3 GHz. It supports up to 64 gigs of RAM, but my model has 16. It also has an M.2 PCIe slot, but it also has room for a 2.5 inch SATA drive, which we'll add here in this video. Now in terms of video output, you have plenty of options. You have two different HDMI ports, and then both of the USB-C ports can also provide video as well. And finally, this ships with Windows 11 Pro. Now if you go to the Minis Forum website, you'll be able to read a little bit more about this device and you can kind of see some examples of that alt mode USB-C that I was talking about in the introduction. To me, this is super awesome because it makes for a very clean setup. And in addition, this mini PC comes with its own vertical stand to give it an even smaller footprint. And so in that regard, it seems to be a very fitting workstation beyond the whole gaming thing that we'll focus on here. For example, if you happen to have four different monitors that all ran 4K 60Hz, you'd be able to run all four of them from that same mini PC. So in that regard, in terms of productivity or potentially using this to like watch movies while you work, this is going to be a pretty cool setup. Okay, let's move on to the unboxing part of the video. Nothing fancy here, it's just a typical mini PC box. I do appreciate the fact that the Minis Forum boxes always seem to be very compact. Now inside the box, we're going to get that vertical stand that I mentioned earlier. And then here is that 65 watt charging brick. This is tiny compared to some of the other options you have on the market. It also comes with an HDMI cable, a USB-C cable for charging, as well as a SATA connection for that two and a half inch hard drive, as well as some hard drive screws. And finally, there's also a Visa mount if you wanted to attach it to the back of a monitor. Okay, let's have a look at the thing itself and get some first impressions. First impressions, I like the size and feel of this altogether. Lately, a lot of mini PCs have been getting bigger and bigger, but this one seems to stay to that true smaller size. Now, unfortunately, other than the grill vents, everything else is made out of plastic. I kind of wish that the sides at least were made out of aluminum. On the left, we have a CMOS reset button, a power button, a headphone and mic input, and then two USB-C ports. The one on the right can also provide a video signal. And then also along the sides here, you can see there is some cooling ventilation as well. Now on the back, we have that power delivery USB-C that can also function as video out. And then we have a two and a half gigabit ethernet port, two USB 3.2 ports, dual HDMI, and then finally two USB 2.0 ports. On the bottom, we don't have anything else really going on other than the visa mounts. But one thing to note here, these screws are actually underneath the pads at the bottom. Okay, so there you go. That's one minor complaint. I wish I didn't have to pull the pads off to get to the screws. Anyway, here is that vertical stand. As you can see, it looks pretty good. Now the stand itself is kind of form fitting to the mini PC, but it's not perfect. You will have to kind of angle it in gently to make sure it's evenly balanced. But yeah, this is what it looks like with the vertical stand. I'll show you what it's like here on the desk later on. But first, let's actually open this up and take a look inside. As I mentioned, taking those pads off is kind of a pain in the butt, especially because I feel like the stickiness of the pads will go away if you do this often. Now, one nice thing here is they have a little gap here on the edge, which allows you to put your thumbnail in so you can pry this open. So that was kind of convenient. Okay, taking a look on the inside here, nice and clean as typical. 
And as you can see, they're using name brand components. This is Kingston RAM, eight gigabytes each. And I did look up the speed of these RAM modules here. It is 2666 megahertz. So potentially you could upgrade this to a faster RAM chip if you'd like. On the other side, you can see the M.2 slots for both the hard drive as well as the Wi-Fi chip. And it's kind of hard to read the Wi-Fi chip here, but it is the MT7921K. We've seen this chip before. It's in the iNeo Next and a couple other devices. It runs with Wi-Fi 6E as well as Bluetooth 5.0. And so I think that's a pretty nice and future-proof chip. Here's a quick look at the hard drive, 512 gigs. And then here on the bottom cover, you can see there's a little bit of a slot for adding a two and a half inch drive. Now, surprisingly, there's only holes on one side of the drive here. As you can see, it just kind of sits balanced on the other. I don't think it's going to be a big deal, especially for a mini PC that's going to be stationary. Now, in order to get it connected, you would use that adapter that they have in the box and you just plug it directly into the motherboard and then right into your hard drive. And that's it. We've now installed a two terabyte drive in addition to our NVMe. In terms of sizing, this thing is pretty small. I would say it's about two and a quarter Kerrygold butters. And so if you're doing the math, that's somewhere between 18 and 20 ounces altogether. For a more realistic comparison, it's about the size of an Xbox Series controller. So altogether, yeah, it's a pretty small mini PC. Here's what it looks like here on my desk. Now, I've definitely seen smaller mini PCs out in the market, but I do think this one's a good size, especially if space is a premium for you. The only other minor complaint I have is that red and black fan wire is visible through the front grille here. But other than that, I think it looks pretty nice and sleek. Now let's take a look at it with a vertical orientation. And as you can see, it has a much smaller footprint. And so if you have a little bit of vertical space to work with, like say, for example, you want to place it next to a speaker, this could totally be done. All right, now that we have the device booted up, let's go ahead and look inside of it and see what we have under the hood. And as expected, it has the Ryzen 5 5625U, 16 gigs of RAM, and it's running Windows 11 Pro. Now out of the box, I actually didn't do anything to this device other than just running the AMD software to update the drivers. Now I'm gonna focus primarily on PC gaming and retro game emulation here in this video, but I did wanna run a quick Cinebench just to see kind of its thermal limits. And as you can see here, when I'm running at 100% load, it's getting about 67 degrees Celsius altogether. Now, depending on where it was in the whole render test, there were moments where I saw it spiking up to about 75, 78 degrees. And there was a moment where it did jump up to 85 degrees, but that was only for a moment. On average, under a 100% load, this stayed under 70 degrees Celsius. So that's pretty good for thermals. Okay, so let's jump into the meat and potatoes of the video here and start doing some game testing. We're going to start with PC games and we'll start with the lightest games and then move our way up from there. And as a quick background of how I benchmark each of my videos, what I typically will do is start everything at 1080p resolution. And then generally I will run at the default settings or higher settings if they'll run at 60 frames per second. And from there, I just kind of work my way up to some of the harder games and see which ones aren't going to run at a full speed. From there, I will usually keep it at 1080p, but then I'll start lowering the settings to something like low graphical settings. And finally, if that doesn't work, then I'll drop it to 720p and see how it looks. And so across the board, all the games that you're seeing here ran absolutely fine, 1080p, 60 frames per second at the default or high settings. Now, of course, I expected that to be a given when it came to a lot of these 2D games and platformers. But as we started to move our way up into, say, for example, the Xbox 360 era, I was surprised to find that all of these also played at medium settings at a full frame rate as well. For example, games like Bioshock Remastered or Fallout New Vegas, absolutely no problems at these standard settings. Counter-Strike Go worked okay, but honestly, when the action was happening, it would dip down to about 60 frames per second. And so I think when it comes to competitive shooters, that might not be ideal. But when it came to PC gaming, I was actually pretty impressed with the performance here. A game like Ori and the Will of the Wisps is a great example. Usually at this price point, you can't play the game in medium settings at 1080p, but as you can see, it's running just fine here. And so I kept pushing. And so for example, games like Risk of Rain, which is surprisingly hard to run because there's lots of things going on on the screen. It didn't stay at a constant 60, but it was still well above 30. Same thing with Omen Sight, which is another game I've been testing lately that also seems to have some issues with certain hardware. For example, on the Steam Deck, this one also doesn't play at 60 frames. But I will say that for a $500 price point, this was actually very impressive to me. Typically when I review these mini PCs, I usually have to stop it right around Street Fighter V. But that ran well enough at 720p in medium settings that I decided to keep going. 
Resident Evil 3 at 720p was actually pretty good. And same thing with Rise of the Tomb Raider. Even though this is at low settings and 720p, the game looked beautiful. Now, on the other hand, I used those same settings with The Witcher 3, and I didn't actually think this was very good. I was also surprised to find that the Skywalker Saga, the most recent LEGO game, actually played pretty well at low settings in 1080p. For the most part, it would stay above 30 frames per second, and then maybe dip down to 25 here and there. And so I would say the upper limit of this device was actually Control. And this was running at low settings in 1080p, but as you can see, it's struggling even to maintain 20 frames per second. It's still running at a pretty good speed, but very choppy. Either way, I was super impressed with the PC gaming performance at this price point. But now let's move on to my favorite part, which is retro game emulation. We're going to dive right into the big stuff, so we'll start with PSP. And across the board, what I found here is that if I set it to a 4x resolution, which is 1080p, everything I threw at it ran at a full frame rate. In fact, God of War Chains of Olympus played so well that I decided to push it even further. This is usually my benchmark game, but I did want to try those really hard ones. And generally, the other two games that I will try that are also as bad as God of War are going to be Resistance Retribution, as well as Killzone Liberation. Now, personally, I'm not a big fan of these two games, so that's why I don't really show them that often. But as you can see here, they're still running at full speed. So this thing is a PSP monster. Let's move up to the next generation. We'll start with GameCube next. And same thing here, I set everything to a 3x resolution or also 1080p upscale. And again, this little mini PC ran through these like a hot knife and butter. It actually got to that sweet spot that I really love to get to when it comes to emulation. This is the point where I don't have to actually make any sort of settings tweaks. Instead, I can just set it to a 1080p resolution, turn on every game, and then just start going. And so in that regard, GameCube was awesome on this thing. In fact, I played a bunch of games on this because it was so good. So I'll let those play out here for a minute. Get to the left side. That'll do it for the Bay Sox in the first. Okay, now let's move up to the next system here, Nintendo Wii. And across the board, this one actually did very good. There were a few games that did have some slowdown. For example, Kirby's Epic Yarn did have issues every time it needed to compile a new shader. And the same thing happened with Super Mario Galaxy 2. This is a very typical thing with the Dolphin emulator, but all the same, I did want to make note of it. The only other game that I found some slowdown with is Tatsunoko vs. Capcom. And this would only happen every time I had to do one of those big moves, but even then the slowdown was kind of minimal. Other than those three games, Nintendo Wii ran really well. Okay, let's move over to PlayStation 2. For this, I used the most recent nightly build of PCSX2, and I alternated between the DirectX 11 and Vulkan backends. Generally, I would start with the Vulkan backend and then move over to DirectX 11 if it had any issues. 
Similarly, if it still didn't play very well, I would drop it down to 720p. A good example of this is Tony Hawk's Underground, which did not play at full speed under Vulkan or 1080p. But as you can see, with DirectX 11, no problem. And so again, I tested a ton of PS2 games, and so I'll let these ones play out. Just make note here at the bottom of whether or not I was playing it at 1080p or 720p. And then also at the top, you can see which video backend I chose. But I think overall, with the exception of the two God of War games, almost everything played at playable speeds. You can interrupt help desk message. of rebound to Garnett, but Trey air balls the three, rebounded by Manu. Now let's go over to Craig Sager. This device is a communicator. With it, my father and I can give you advice at any time during your quest. When your opponent doesn't offer you much, you really need to go after him with a balanced attack. Head, body, movement, combos. No one thing will beat him. Throw a lot at him. Master Windu, there's the first anti-orbital cannon. My sensors indicate several enemy units moving on our position. Okay, let's move over to the original Xbox. This one had some mixed results. In general, I had to play them at a native resolution because 720p was too hard, and I would say it was about half and half in terms of which ones played at full speed and which ones didn't. For example, Dead or Alive 3, no problem, same thing with Jet Set Radio Future. However, unfortunately, even with that first outdoor encounter, Halo Combat Evolved did not play at full speed. And so what we'll do here is we'll test this in Linux later to see if we can get any improvement. For now, let's move on to another system. Let's do Wii U this time. I'm going to play everything at a native resolution, which is typically going to be 720p, but it will be 1080p for some other games. And long story short with this one, everything seemed to play pretty well. You know, some games would dip below 60 frames per second. I think that Mario Kart is a good example there, but a lot of others played at a solid 60 frames. The only game that truly struggled was Zelda Breath of the Wild. This one had a hard time keeping up to 30 frames per second. But I tested quite a few of these too, so I'll let these play out and we'll move on to PS3. Now PS3 was also mixed. This is one where some games played really well, but then there were others which just quite weren't up to snuff. So for example, Dead or Alive 5, no problem here. Same thing with Demon Souls. These souls played at full speed, no problem. One all. 
Now other games couldn't maintain 60 frames per second. These ones here are a great example. But the thing is about these that yeah, even though they didn't reach 60 frames per second, they were still really playable. And so I think if you have a real hankering for some of these choice PS3 games and you don't mind a little bit of slowdown here and there, this will still be okay. But I will say that once you start getting into a more open world, you're definitely going to see some issues. Prince of Persia is a great example here. This one really struggled to get up to 30 frames per second, especially in some of those open world environments. And so I think rather than trying to emulate the PS3 version of this game, you might be better served just using the PC version instead. And same thing with Devil May Cry, this one also could not get up to 30 frames per second. It still played at a relatively good speed, but it was really choppy. And finally, the last home console system I wanted to test was Nintendo Switch. When it came to 2D games and some of those more lightweight ones, no problem here whatsoever. But I will say that once you start introducing some 3D elements to a game, things like Super Mario 3D World, it's just not quite up to full speed. And so here you have a couple options. One of the things you could do is turn off docked mode so it's going to lower the resolution and you might get some better gameplay. But the thing is, I don't really think that the undock mode looks very good on a TV or monitor anyway, and so I personally wouldn't recommend that route. And so I would say in general, just maybe not consider this to be a Nintendo Switch emulating mini PC. I think this is just really the upper limit of what we're going to find here. Now, one last test on the Windows side, I did want to try a little bit of Nintendo 3DS, and as you can see here, it did have some slowdown with Mario Kart 7. But I think this is the perfect segue to try out Linux. So what we're going to do here is we're going to boot up Bodicera using a USB flash drive. And if you've seen any of my other mini PC videos, this is one of the standard tests I like to do is to make sure that it runs Linux and then also see how it runs with Bodicera. And I think this serves two purposes. One, it lets you see how the drivers work in Linux. But then two, this also gives you an idea of whether or not this PC would work as a dedicated retro gaming machine. And I think that Bodicera is a great platform to do that. Not only do these games perform just about the same or better as they are in Windows, but then also you can navigate everything through this really nice system and then also use your controller to do that navigation. So I'm just going to test out a few games here just to make sure everything's running okay. We're going to start with Xbox. Now this is running at a 2x resolution, so double the resolution that we found on Windows. And as you can see here, we're getting between 59 and 60 frames the entire time. So this is an indication to me that Xbox is going to be a lot better on the Bodicera side than it will on Windows, and this is often the case. Now it's not perfect, for example Halo 2 running at a 2x resolution wasn't quite at full speed, so you will probably have to drop this one down to a native resolution instead. And another thing that usually runs better on Linux than it does on Windows is Nintendo 3DS. And as you can see here, Mario Kart 7, no issues whatsoever. And same thing with games like Super Mario 3D Land or Ridge Racer 3D. So if you do want to play some 3DS games, I would recommend doing it on Linux over Windows. Now just to check, I also tested out some of the other retro consoles that we didn't test in Windows. So for example, Nintendo 64 runs at no problem with a 1080p upscale. And same thing with Sega Dreamcast with the widescreen hack on 1080p, no problem. And one last verification here, God of War Chains of Olympus also runs at 1080p really well. Okay, that was a lot of game testing, so I think it's time to do a summary. Let's start with the things I like about the device and we'll move on to what I don't like after that. To start, it sounds kind of ironic, but this is a true mini PC. Not only does it have a very small form factor, but that plug, the 65 watt USB-C charging port, is just really awesome. It makes everything really small and compact. And if you have a monitor that supports alt mode, you'll be able to power everything and also provide the video through a single line. I think using that one small plug plus that vertical orientation option will give it a very small footprint. And as we saw when it came to performance, the PC gaming was actually really good. And then the emulation was also great. Everything up to Switch was awesome. And finally, I like the fact that this company didn't skimp anywhere. The only thing that I could maybe give it a ding for is that the RAM was only 2666 megahertz, but still that's pretty fast. And honestly, 3200 megahertz is very expensive RAM, so it makes sense they didn't use it. So now let's talk about some of the things that I don't like about this device. And fair warning, there are not a lot of things here. The only things I could think of were the fact that it doesn't have a DisplayPort plug. It does have dual HDMI, but if your monitor only has a DisplayPort input, this might be a bummer. 
Also, I kind of don't like the fact that it's only made out of plastic. I wish that there was some aluminum around either the sides or the top. I think it would have just given the mini PC a more solid feeling to it. And the last point here is no fault of the mini PC itself, but it is the fact that the manufacturer is offering an upgraded option, which is actually not that much more expensive than this one. For an additional $50, you're going to get two additional cores and then much better benchmarks as well. And I'm looking forward to testing this out as soon as I get my hands on it, but as you can see here, it does look to be quite a bit better. Those two additional cores will also help with PS3 emulation as well. And so we're kind of at a weird point here. Do I think that the Ryzen UM560 is a great deal at $500? Absolutely. But I also suspect that the 5800 for an additional $50 is going to be an even better deal. Now, both of these mini PCs are up for pre-order right now and they'll start shipping next month. And so if you want, you could make that decision right now. Or if you wait a few weeks, I'll have the other one in my hand and I'll try that one out next. But in the end, let me know what you think in the comments below. I'm super excited about this new line of devices from Mini's forum. They're definitely not the most powerful mini PCs on the market today, but out of all the mini PCs that I've tested, this one seems to have that perfect balance of features, price, and performance. So let me know in the comments below if you agree. As always, thank you for watching, and be sure to like and subscribe if you found this helpful, and we will see you next time. Happy gaming.